And so I'm going to focus primarily on the undergrad, looking at that um, area of opportunity. And then um, Dr. Matthews is then going to present more on the graduate. And we'll, we're going to bring it all together. So as I look at this, I, um, I, I feel like we've had such a great discussion today. In fact, as I was um, going through the, the morning and having the opportunity to see the presenters, I was really inspired. Um, I also thought that, wow, there's, there's so much of what they were going to share um, that I wanted to share was already being presented, which I think that's a really great thing because I think it talks about the level of, where, of engagement that we are here in, in Nebraska. And I, I think the time is now to take some of those next steps to really build what I, I believe are partnerships and connections. Um, you know, technology innovation is going to continue to change um, at a rapid rate um, in, in our future. And so what we always have, though, is that foundation of our, our partnerships, um, really what creates a good psychiatric mental health nurse, that our ability to have those interpersonal um, relationships with each other, um, what I call the partnerships, that can really set that foundation for us to do our best work. And so what I'd like to do is share some things that um, I think are, are essential um, and the dialogue. My hope is that at the end of this session, everybody leaves with one action step that you want to take to really build our um, profession of psychiatric and mental health nursing. Um, I think that we have a lot of talent in Nebraska, in our community, um, and I feel like um, the time is now to do that. What I really find with working with students is our need to be very intentional and fully present um, um, to support our, understand, our students' understanding of psychiatric and mental health. And so what I strive to do and what my colleagues, um, we strive to be um, good role models for psychiatric and mental health. And so that means we need to take care of our own mental health. Um, I'm, I'm very grateful for a colleague who actually has a resiliency course for students. Um, I think that's such a great way that um, self-care is being role modeled. Um, so our professor Jackie Hanks, who, who you heard from earlier this morning. Um, I think it's also important that we highlight the special skills that we have. Um, we just don't take, and what we try to do is really build, I think, some of the things behind the scene that we do as psychiatric and mental health nurses and undergrad is really um, highlight those skills that might seem um, common to everyone, such as the communication skills. And we really provide different exercises and opportunities for students to build those skills and to see those as nursing skills similar to putting in an IV or um, doing some other type of wound care or procedure. And um, the other thing that we really try to do is when someone has a talent in being able to be a very empathetic individual or maybe seeing beyond um, the immediate um, presentation of a patient to a deeper, present, a, a deeper um, assessment, we want to really highlight that. Um, the theme of the American Psychiatric Nursing Association Conference last year, or this past, um, this year, was whole health starts with mental health. And I think I'd like that really to be um, another foundation of what we do, um, really integrating that um, our comprehensive and holistic care of our patients. So um, again, the needs of our current community and our world really call for the skills that we have as psychiatric and mental health nursing. So I just want to share a few um, kind of behind the scene things that we do in undergrad to really create that, um, the skill set for psychiatric mental health nurse with the hopes that we have a discussion and everybody again leaves with an action plan step today on how we're going to um, lead the way in building our profession. So here's the objectives. Um, we've already reviewed a lot of the innovative clinical um, experiences. So again, I really want to focus on us having a discussion and moving forward um, with this. So innovative clinical experiences. Um, Dr. Gail Stewart presented a variety of different um, activities. And um, even when we look at simulations, you know, knowing that those eventually are going to become obsolete, there's going to be new and better ways of educating. And so, um, I think one of the things that we find in, in everything that we're doing is finding ways to really build um, confidence in our students, 
really helping them identify those skills. And I really believe that the skills of therapeutic um, relationships and communications, those are not things that are gonna become obsolete in the nursing profession. And really understanding that although it might be very exciting to put in that IV or you know, passing medications is something that all nurses do, getting them to see that whole person, um, body, mind, and spirit, that can really help them um, see that th that's what a nurse does. And so really we try to engage our students in that process of learning psychiatric mental health is really a foundation to be a nurse that is going to provide high quality care in whatever specialty area they choose. So we help them understand and enhance that knowledge too. Um, the neurobiology and all the advances that have happened, we, um, as a, the first um, slide that talked about, it's science, and we want them to understand that science and be able to compare that with any other medical diagnosis and understand that pathophysiology that is the root of that, um, that issue. And then what do we do as nurses about that um, to make a difference? So we have collaborative learning activities. I think that's one of the areas that I would really say that um, has become more common in our, um, in our education. And our, the APNA, our association, has a wonderful faculty toolkit um, that's really developed. I won't take the time to clip, click on it today because that's available for everybody um, to explore. And the thing I like about it is that it can really be utilized if we are um, educating nursing students or if we're using that as managers on units to really orient that new psychiatric nurse um, that you've hired. Um, we've shared, it's been brought up, that everybody has a variety of different experiences in their undergraduate, and so this could also be easily um, um, transformed into an orientation um, for your unit. A lot of focus that we have um, certainly is on what we call a preclinical seminar or what's fondly called by one of my colleagues as the boot camp for psychiatric and mental health. And, and I think that, you know, I think one of the things is before they even get to a DEU model or the traditional model in which I teach in, um, the students are coming with um, some preconceived notions of what it, it means to be a psychiatric mental health nurse, what's the unit look like, um, some of the different movies that have presented that. Um, I, I think about even, um, you know, our, our own nursing education. I remember my mom, even though she was a nurse, was very fearful that I was going to be a psychiatric and mental health nurse. I, I didn't learn till way after her death that she admired me for that. <laughs> I, I thought it was like, that's not a real nurse, but that's another story. Um, but so for a preclinical seminar, what we really want to work with our students on is um, kind of decreasing some of those fears and anxieties that they have. And we do that by building skills. Um, I also remember working with wonderful ICU nurses um, when I worked in home health, and I remember them being fearful to say or to ask the words, if, um, if how, have you felt about suicide, or however we want to ask that, have you, have you thought about ending your life? And I was just, sometimes I would just kind of step back and think that, um, wow, you are, you are an excellent nurse. You could you could save me if I was having a heart attack, you could um, diagnose something, and I would put my, my life and my family's life in your care, but that was just really not able to articulate that. And I keep that in my mind, and I, I share that with students and saying that no matter what area of nursing that you go into, my hope, my prayers, my goal for you is that you will be able to provide quality care to any patient, um, and that involves um, their psychiatric and mental health needs. And part of that is having that comfort level and asking somebody if they're suicidal. So we work with that, we have that discussion, we do a variety of role plays in that. Um, we also practice therapeutic communication. Um, we want to review some of those mental health diagnosis and some interventions. And that's a time, too, that we explore some of those fears of what if I, what if I say something wrong and I hurt the patient or um, whatever that might be. Um, the other thing is we want to look at what are some of the different therapeutic techniques that we use in mental health. And 
I know that sometimes it's perceived, well, what do you do, lead a group? Um, you know, that was brought up earlier today, and I think it's important for our students then to be able to transform some of those skills that they learn in group therapy so that they understand the therapeutic nature of what goes on in mental health. I was blessed to be on units with nurse therapists that I, I learned a lot from. They were my role models and inspired me to, you know, to go on and advance my education. And so, um, but I, and, I, and we know that that can be a very cost-effective way of, um, of individuals getting um, treatment and therapy. So we also review medications um, and those side effects so that, again, in no matter what setting they're working in, um, students would feel prepared um, to work with that. The other thing that we do, um, and I think probably everybody may have done this at some point, um, is that process recording. Um, a process recording in which um, a student is really kind of recalling what a patient said, what, and then what their response was, and really that analysis, where we allow them to do the identifying the therapeutic communication technique, um, as well as really then going that next step to analyzing the behavior, um, how does that relate to a diagnosis, so that they gain insight um, in what they're doing. And then what is their response? Did they, um, be, based on that, um, you know, maybe they would identify that, um, you know, by the nonverbal behavior that that was more anxiety and being able to bring that forward. We developed a rubric and we made this, we really highlighted that this was an artifact that they could put in their portfolio to demonstrate the skill of, of therapeutic communication. And so that seemed to heighten the level of um, the students, um, I think, understanding, because the rubric provided some guidance, as well as it also elevated it to a skill that you know, was really needed to demonstrate satisfactory performance with that. We added a peer edit process with that, just because you would, as an instructor, you would review um, some of the process recordings and they were just excellent. You could say, wow, this, this student really gets it. And I, you, know, you wanted to highlight that skill when you also saw that there were some students that were maybe missing some key points. And so we, we gave it a, a whirl to see, you know, well, how is this gonna work to do a peer edit as a, as a next step with that? And this, it was very well received by the students as well as it really um, provided great discussion about the importance of that and, um, and then the student was able to make some kind of revisions with that, and, and I felt like it was a really good learning process. So that's something kind of behind the scenes that, that we do as instructors. Um, I think it also would be something for, for newly um, um, graduated nurses that you've hired. Um, teaching classes really want to make, um, I don't think that's a new thing in psychiatric and mental health nurse, nursing. I think one of the things that we're wanting to do to kind of use our time efficiently is really asking the, the students to connect with the population to identify um, what are, what are their needs? And so that kind of served two purposes that helped them build that therapeutic communication and building that therapeutic relationship with our, the population they were gonna work with. And then also, of course, there's the skills and um, actually teaching, um, so they're understanding um, um, effective techniques in, um, in psychiatric and mental health. So whether it's didactic or practicum, a lot of what we're really working on is trying to make those active learning um, um, classes. And so I think part of what, um, what can happen is that there's a lot of content to cover in psychiatric and mental health. And I think that really then, um, I think, challenges all of us to look and say, well, how can we do this effectively? And how do we use some of those different teaching um, modalities? I mean, the, app, the apps are something that I think would be a very effective way to integrate. Um, we really try to do role modeling. Um, um, app, app, asking them to perhaps do um, a role modeling. We, we teach therapeutic communication, and um, I, I took Dr. Um, Gail Stewart's uh, message last year at the APNA conference about um, that motivational interviewing. I, I took that, and because I get the opportunity to do the therapeutic communication um, class, and so, but we integrated motivational interviewing, and then we gave some examples of how we could utilize that, some role play in the class to, for, for students to apply. We find that some students like that mode of education, and others don't. However, what we do know is that the learning outcomes are greater if they've had that opportunity to apply the information. So we try to utilize that both in the didactic as well as the practicum. Um, one of the things that 
I always want to make sure that we have enough time for in our practicum is the, um, the ability for conferences that are both structured and some of those that, you know, that there's time allowed for the student just to ex share their experience that they had, maybe some different emotions that they experienced or, or things that were triggered. I, I think one of the pieces that's so important that we do um, as clinical instructors is that we're helping our students grow in their self-awareness. Um, so we continue to do reflections weekly. Um, some students, some places may not um, do that. Some courses may not, but we felt that need for that self-awareness is, is critical with that. Um, as well as we want to be open to knowing that some of the different situations in our settings could be triggering for students. And I think just as we, um, you know, when we talk about um, whole health starts with mental health, that's really a very important foundational piece that we have to start with too, is that our students are coming from various um, traumas, adverse child experiences that they may not even be in their awareness until they're in a clinical setting and it can be triggered. So we have to be very um, sensitive to that as well. Simulations, as we've talked about, we utilize um, both low fidelity and high fidelity. Um, I think it's important there um, that we level those um, again, because simulations, they themselves can be a little bit um, anxiety provoking, but if we start out with lower um, fidelity and then moving to the more um, higher fidelity, it, it seems to help um, students have a, a better experience. Um, I think the main thing it does is build confidence, that overall knowledge, um, student learning, and then really enhancing that safety and quality. If they've been faced with a situation, um, and, and a lot of times with simulations, we're gonna look at those maybe lower incident type of clinical situations that happen, then we're able to, um, when it does happen on a clinical setting, um, they're gonna be more prepared for that. And then that's overall gonna um, promote um, safety and quality. I'm not, um, the therapeutic and comprehensive role, um, I have to apologize, I, I don't know why I put designated education units on this slide, so I'm gonna ask for apology and just point out it's dedicated staff, nurses, um, instructors, organizations that have those, so I apologize, I, I don't know why I put designated, please forgive me. Um, internships, students get very excited about the opportunity to have an internship prior to their senior year. Preceptorships um, within the psychiatric and mental health can be a way that students build those relationships and have a better understanding of um, psychiatric and mental health nursing, as well as residency, because um, we know that psychiatric and mental health is challenging, and to have that year that they can really build those skills can help develop a um, professional trajectory for psychiatric mental health nursing. We've had wonderful um, dedicated education units, the presentation there, so I'm not going to take any more time with that today. Um, we had a wonderful presentation to see the many opportunities that it presents. I'm, I'm very proud of Nebraska and having um, two psychiatric and mental health um, designated education units, um, excuse me, dedicated education units. So I think, as I don't wanna take up too much time, I think I'm, there's really lots of opportunities um, to promote the profession of psychiatric and mental health nursing. And when we look at that, um, the student mentorship opportunities, I think as, um, I, I, opportunities as, um, for, for students maybe to shadow us. Some examples is that if there's an interested student at the college, their advisor will connect them to myself or one of my colleagues, and we try to do those extra things to help them have opportunities for shadowing. Um, I some, and I, I think one of the things and takeaways that I have after this conference is what can we do more intentional or structured um, to promote that, um, that mentorship. Role modeling, as I've mentioned, is, is so critical, and that, um, that we see and, and we really live out what, how we can be leaders in mental health, and that we have a seat at the table when it comes to promoting quality um, mental health and, and overall health um, to populations. Involvement in professional organizations, inviting our students and maybe our newly um, um, hired staff to the professional organization meetings can be a way to get them connected. Um, interprofessional collaboration, um, I see this in both um, the work that I do in 
um, psychiatric mental health as well um, in an acute care um, unit as well as when I work on the um, in community um, I try to show them different ways that a psychiatric and mental health nurse um, the skill set that they can offer with that and in offering them opportunities then um, you know, to, to actually see that and, and to be a part of that. And then they can witness the, the very special role and the, um, that we have and the, the skill set. Service learning, I think the big, that is huge. It helps our, um, our, our students understand um, the voice and hear the stories of the population that we work with. And I think that's really important because I think um, it will really reduce the stigma. And many times I've had students share that they have been very, um, they were fearful, they weren't sure what they were gonna do, but then once they heard the voice of the, of the, of the patients, the population that they were caring for, it changed their perspective. And then we have that discussion about, you know, how, how do we promote that? You know, how do you, you have a role um, to reduce the stigma and so that there can be that quality mental health um, in, our, in our country. Um, involvement, students get very excited to be involved in research. I think that's another opportunity as we sit um, in a room um, with all of us between different organizations and different faculty and even different colleges of nursing. Um, this is really an opportunity for us to, to get our students involved in research. Share our stories, our positive stories, not just our scary stories. Um, finding those students that really um, seem to have that talent and mentoring them and highlighting that is a very special skill set. And as we've talked about, I, that's just in summary. So leave us with um, what's one action step you're going to take to build our, um, our profession. Um, so keep calm, and we're going to set some new goals. I think together we can really make a difference um, in our community. I can just take some questions, if anyone has any questions, why Dr. Matthews gets set up. We're going to have a summit of the people that attended the summit to use Dr. Stewart's strategic plan template and uh, get it going for our division. Uh, Sarah, you mentioned that you taught in the traditional program. How does that differ from uh, either the accelerated or the the DEU units? Um, Okay, thank you, Dr. Wolf. And actually, I do teach in the Accelerated, which is a one-year program. These are students that have already have a degree, and they come in, they're very focused, they have experience, um, which can be positive or, or negative, so that can be in a way that um, we're able to take that, though. Um, they want everything to be done very efficiently. They don't have a lot of extra time to do things. But I've been very surprised at how um, interested they are in like service learning. So if we can, I, I kind of say, if we can do two things at once, like you're, you're doing your clinical, but you're also doing some service learning, it can be really great. Um, I think the difference for me from a, doing a traditional model versus the DEU is certainly all of what um, was presented this morning, all of the, the different, um, I think, value um, was really well presented. What I try to do in the traditional unit is still create some of those same experiences um, with, the, um, with the students that I have. They don't have necessarily that one-on-one, -on -one, but we try to provide them um, with some of those same experiences. And, and we know that um, the DU model isn't available for every, every place, but I still want us to kind of leave with some of those same um, goals or some of the same blessings that come from um, the DU are things that we should all strive for um, in really developing our workforce and really our profession of psychiatric and mental health. And, and we know at the end of the day it's worth it because it's going to promote the overall quality of mental health. Um, ultimately, I would like us in the future to be having discussions on how we, you know, it's, it's prevention. You know, I think that's another discussion we haven't had yet, but in the meantime, we have a lot of um, mental health um, challenges. All right, well, thank you, Sarah. I uh, had the 
honor and privilege to be one of Sarah's instructors years back when she uh, became a psych nurse practitioner and she was a rock star student. I can uh, attest to that and as you can see she's a rock star um, faculty as well at Creighton. So anyway, good job Sarah. Very inspirational. Okay, well my presentation is going to focus more on the um, graduate program es establishing educational opportunities and we'll talk briefly about um, establishing work opportunities. That's not as much in our ballpark, but um, and because of the great demand, we don't have to spend a lot of time finding op work opportunities for the nurse practitioners. So I'm gonna focus primarily on the MSN or the Psych Mental uh, Health Nurse Practitioner and just touch a little bit on the DNP program we have as well. We still have a master's program here, um, just mainly because of the great need for um, increasing the amount of the workforce, especially in our rural areas, and um, the rural um, staff and uh, administrators feel that still that MSN degree is very valuable, and maybe not all nurse practitioners um, need to have a DNP in order to practice in the in the rural areas. And so we still plan on continuing the MSN. Uh, nurse practitioner program at UNMC. So um, how do we establish our educational experiences? Well, we have guidelines. There's the National Organization of Nurse Practitioner Faculty Guidelines, and these are quite extensive. There's numerous categories within these guidelines that we need to educate students in, including um, scientific knowledge, leadership, policy, practice, ethics, um, healthcare delivery, technology and information. And that's all aside from just working on how we teach a nurse practitioner to deliver uh, good patient care. So there is a lot of background information that the nurse practitioners have to learn too. So it's um, a kind of an overwhelming amount of content when you look at all those <laughs> areas. But generally, when we're working on just the clinical content, of course, we're looking at their making sure they have good assessment skills, diagnostic skills, and that they are safe uh, medication prescribers and high quality medication prescribers as well. And within the NOMF guidelines, they also um, recommend that we teach the uh, psych NPs two uh, modalities of psychotherapy. And actually, I was going to—I didn't really introduce myself very well. Um, I am a psychologist, actually. I'm, my PhD is in developmental and child psychology, but I am also a, an, a pediatric nurse practitioner and a psych nurse practitioner. So I've kind of been to school quite a few years. Um, <laughs> but peds it really is my was my original love. Um, I also was always interested in mental health, so I was very glad that I could combine my my two loves. Um, but Anyway, so as you were talking, Gail, we, um, I, am not, I do not have a PhD in nursing. It's in psychology. So we are trying to integrate having interdisciplinary type um, um, faculty in, in the program. So anyway, but what NAMF really wants us to do is to teach our psych NPs two modes of therapy where they are proficient. So again, that takes a lot of uh, additional effort and um, work to try and make sure they are competent in these areas. So aside from that, when we look at what are the clinical experiences, again, we're looking for quality preceptors. We want to make sure it's, it's comprehensive. So we are teaching across the lifespan in the Psych NP program. They have to learn from three-year-olds to 90-year-olds. How do That's a lot of content for um, a nurse practitioner to learn. And then the broad diagnoses that are included. <coughs> the child diagnoses are much different than the, the older um, adolescent, yes, and adult and the gerontology diagnosis. So there's a really broad range of information that these students need to learn. Um, most um, psych mental health nurse, nurse practitioner programs have a hybrid approach, meaning that there may be some in-class um, 
coursework that's done where they actually go to school in a brick and mortar building, but a lot of the programs are online. Here at UNMC, we kind of have a combination and you know, I'm kind of still a little old school, so I make the students come in to at least a few of the classes and, I, and not that they really have to be there to learn. We all know our technology is quite good that they can listen online, but I believe that networking that occurs when the students get together is really valuable for them. And most students, even though they don't like to drive in or find a parking place, um, you know, it seems like <laughs> that's, that's an issue. Um, they do enjoy being able to communicate with each other and actually see each other and, and, and that there's a face to that little square, you know, that they see online. Uh, we do um, use lectures trying to modify those where there are more modules, where there are short base type lectures. And we also encourage and use a lot of problem based learning. So through discussion boards on blackboards, usually it's through a case scenario that the students learn um, just um, their, their problem based learning strategies. Um, I just, as I was preparing for this lecture, we currently in our program don't, do not use a lot of simulated learning experiences, but um, here was a, a study that was done by Erin that described using objective structured clinical examination. So this is similar to using simu simulated where uh, the students have to act out clinical scenarios. And some programs actually hire actors to serve as the patients. You don't have to though, you could have other students or faculty perhaps be the patient to help learn if the, if the student actually is is if their competencies are building or if they are able to show those skills that we are expecting them to do. So it can be used not only as a evaluation tool, but it's also a learning tool to make sure that they are building and learning on those communication skills, understanding different diagnoses, assessment, making sure they can do a, a, a good um, evaluation for whether it be ADHD or depression, anxiety. And then also in these case scenarios, they uh, build in diverse uh, type of populations. So it kind of helps build that cultural competency and, to, and it helps the, the, the student also um, kind of reflect on their own biases and assuring that they are learning about the diverse uh, populations that they may work with. So um, as far as how do we teach um, psych NP students to really be competent in, in uh, deliver in psychotherapy. So um, a study by Lusk showed how she uh, was able to incorporate uh, some CBT with children and adolescents through Melnick's COPE model. COPE is creating opportunities for personal in, um, empowerment. And so that's a, a CBT program that she uh, incorporates in her curriculum where they have a didactic four hour workshop. And then with the students, they have um, small group practice sessions. So I thought this would be a really a nice way where this could be partially done online as well and um, still then have students come in either through um, Adobe Connect or Skype where they can practice with each other doing CBT or else just actually come into the clinical setting and um, use those skills. And her last study essentially showed, um, looked at it, it was a qualitative study um, de describing the experiences of 118 students and they reported an increase in usefulness, improved in understanding of the um, type of therapy that's needed and if they feel like they need to refer that patient out um, to another therapist, who that ther therapist might be. And maybe it isn't CBT that the person might need, maybe it's interpersonal therapy instead. And also to um, seek out more continuing education. I think once they felt like they had a little bit of background of how I can implement CBT, then you're ready to kind of do maybe more extended workshops that they could get through their professional organizations. Um, and it increased their confidence as being rather a holistic provider instead of just thinking that you're a medication prescriber. And one of the first things I asked my students when on their first class, I said, now do you think that your job is, is just to prescribe medications? And of course, they do not get very good response from me if they say yes. So I really incorporate the importance of using um, behavioral or um, other psychotherapeutic mo um, modalities that are appropriate for the patient. Um, so that's sort of what we do um, for our didactic experiences for education. 
So the, the bigger challenge for me is to find those clinical placements. And I would say we've heard that theme throughout the day today. And it's something I can't sleep about at night sometimes. So, um, uh, so our problem here in Nebraska, of course, is this broad rural area and, uh, and the shortage that we have of, of preceptors out in the rural communities. But um, so if we have students in the Northeast or the West or uh, the central part of the state, we obviously want to place those students in their community areas. And um, then those here in, in Omaha or Lincoln, we try and assure that they get to the urban providers as well. Um, but the availability of the preceptors is really difficult. And the things I want to look for in the preceptors, what's the amount of time they've had in, in clinical experience? So we generally like all of our preceptors to have at least uh, one year of experience, but more is better, of course. And what's the time and support that they have for teaching? I've had numerous, e even uh, folks that I've talked to here today that say, you know, I have, I'm so busy and they expect me to put out these RVUs it is so difficult to have a student. So how do we then try and either work with those organizations and institutions to assure that the, uh, even though a preceptor maybe wants to teach, they might not be able to because of their organizational demands? Generally, if we, the academic settings, they don't have, I mean, there's usually support to teach, but you're still sort of overloading those um, preceptors in the same setting all the time. As a matter of fact, I also do some clinic work at Monroe Meyer, and we actually have five students from my class at Monroe Meyer in one week period of time, just because we are expected to be um, the educators, but um, it, it kind of does overload the system. So factors to consider for um, clinical placement. Additionally, I used goodness of fit. I don't know if many of you pediatric people know of Chess and Thomas' goodness of fit between a parent and a child. Well, I kind of think there's a goodness of fit between a student and a preceptor. So when I'm thinking about those assignments, I want to look at even the personality match between the preceptor and the student. Because you just knowing the preceptors and knowing that student to some degree, you're going to know who might work, who might fit best. Um, what's the degree of experience of the student? Some of our students come in with a lot of uh, past psych experience, and then those students are great, and you can about put them anywhere. But some of the um, younger, more novice nurses, you, you might have to be a little bit more careful and selective who you place them with. You want to make sure that's going to be a preceptor who's going to um, give them the time, attention, um, uh, maybe a little bit additional more surveillance, and recognize that they're going to maybe need um, maybe a longer period of time in an observation mode, and will that preceptor allow that? Uh, as in contrast, then, those that are very well experienced, I like to set them up with the preceptor that I know might allow more autonomy because they might be bored just observing. And again, that's just by getting to know your preceptors where you set um, them up with different people like that. Um, so other factors to consider might be some student preferences. We have a, um, our last practicum for the students. We allow them to do sort of more elective type um, areas of clinical. So they might want to work in areas such as trauma and attachment. Um, those are the students we might start thinking about letting them work in the correctional facilities or getting their preceptorship there. I wouldn't want to put the first clinical experience in the correctional facility. I think that's overwhelming and, and um, very stressful. Uh, some might want to spend more time in child and adolescent or gerontology. They might want experience at the VA, uh, working with the PTS, um, individuals with PTSD, and of course those with substance use disorders. But I generally like, we want to have our students have the basic, more community, um, mental health kind of experiences first, and when they're strong in those areas, then we put them more into the subspecialty areas. So how do we help increase our, our preceptors or so that they're willing to take students? And so some of the things we do, but I don't think we do enough, and, and this is something I'm certainly going to want to ask for your advice as to how we can increase um, the likelihood, the probability that you will want to be a preceptor again. So first of all, we do try and give some recognition for the work. So we do send out letters and of thank you. Um, 
We also, the, um, any preceptor who uh, takes a student, as you know, they have less amount of uh, continuing education credits that you need to, to um, recertify for your certification. So those are kind of two you know, kudos that we can give. But I think um, good communication between the preceptors and the faculty is so important. Getting to know those preceptors um, and having a central communicator. One of the problems that I see is that sometimes our students might know a preceptor and they might go ask if, um, I, if they can be a student with them, but as a faculty member, I may have already asked that um, preceptor to be um, a preceptor. So they're getting several people asking them, and so it's really difficult to, um, it's, it's annoying for those preceptors to be getting a lot of uh, phone calls. So it's best to have one central communicator. Um, we do offer handouts to our preceptors as well. There's a preceptor handout that's probably as lengthy as they want it to be, but at least it gives them basic information about the coursework that the students have done and what sort of expectations we have for the preceptors. Um, and then it's we encourage our students to maybe bring some donuts or bagels in or something to the preceptors. That just adds a little bit of extra incentive for them to want to continue to do it. But as I'm, one of the things, like I said, is please, um, if you have ideas how we can help increase um, preceptors, I'm just very willing to hear that. So then establishing work experiences for the psych mental health nurse practitioner, this generally is not a problem for us. The demand is high here. I have yet to find a, or hear from a nurse practitioner who just graduated that they're struggling with finding a job. It's pretty rare. I mean, there's, that's not a big issue for us. I mean, nationally with the Affordable Care Act, and you know, we all know that this is in a state of flux right now, but it generally should increase our demand with more people becoming insured. Um, we definitely need a, providers who can provide the full scope of practice, and there's definitely an increase in demand in the geriatrics and community mental health services. So those are clear. Um, uh, these are facts that we know are true, so we just need to be able to help um, increase the workforce by putting out more um, qualified nurse practitioners. And of course, expanding our capacity in the primary care setting is very important. That's another thing we are trying to do is increasing the amount of psych NPs that we are uh, training in primary care. We were just very fortunate, uh, Gail, to get, we got one of those um, B-set grants uh, through HRSA, and we now have four students who will receive $10,000 in their last year of training if they are in a primary care setting or an underserved area. And Dr. Evans will be speaking about that in the next presentation. So that is uh, one way that we can also help make uh, education more affordable for the students and then um, gradually, hopefully, um, place more psych NPs right in that primary care setting so they get it exposure to team-based approach. Um, some of the other um, types of work they can do is increase mental health screenings in the primary care settings, help those many, many individuals out there with substance use disorders, and then also increase the telehealth within those smaller communities in the rural health area. And then finally, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about recruitment and retention. Now back to the undergrad area, and I don't wanna cross over too much on Sarah's um, work here, but this is something that Beacon here has helped us with at UNMC. Um, so we know that um, psych nurse pre psychiatric mental health nurses, these are now at the um, baccalaureate level comprise about 4% of the nursing workforce. That's a pretty, very small percent. So we still have very, very low rates of nurses in the psychiatric field. About 50% of those are in um, hospitals, psych mental health hospitals, and the 50% are out in the community. We know that there is difficulty with attracting and retaining, we've heard that. And a couple study, or this was a, a qualitative study again by Hopper, um, interviewed new nurses who were out just one year and were working in the um, psych mental health field, and they reported they felt devalued and isolated by other nursing colleagues. 
And um, for those nurses who did seek mental health, these are for us new students. Um, we f they felt the attrition rate obviously is high, and it's because of role ambiguity and inconsistent preceptorships. So we still have a lot of work to do um, in increasing our retention and how we are kind of taking care of our young when they do go into the mental health field. Um, one other area, I guess I, I thought I had it on a slide, but maybe um, I didn't. Um, as in, in the undergrad program, these nurses also felt that when they told their colleagues, their fellow students, that they were going into psych nursing, they were like, Ooh, you know, it, they still there's still that attitude, and so I feel strongly we need to change that in the undergrad um, area too. And I believe someone talked about having a, a strong passion as the undergrad faculty to be able to um, exude that enthusiasm for psych, mental health, nursing, and that's something I think we just need to work on as a profession to improve our attitude. And I'm going to show you a, a video here in a few minutes that I think will help. Um, at least to stimulate us, and what I'm hoping to do is to stimulate other students to get that attitude that this is really important work that we all can be passionate, passionate about. So Beacon has done a great job for helping us at, at UNMC College of Nursing and, and I believe with Creighton too, and to increase our psychiatric clinical experiences. One other thing they, ha they have encouraged us to do is to start a um, special interest group. So we have done that on the UNMC campus. We, are, we have five different campuses, so we are kind of just now in the process of trying to determine if intercampus is going to be the way we can do it or if we're going to have to stay individualized uh, because of different clinical schedules. It sounds like we might have to do individual on each campus, but that's to help stimulate um, the interest and for these nurses to go into um, psychiatric nursing. Um, they also have supported our preceptorships. It was through Beacon that we received the grant to be able to support those students through the HRSA grant. We also have another grant, and um, a line grant, that I think, Julie, you're going to talk about in your presentation as well, that also in, uh, provides support for uh, rural mental health nurse practitioners. And I think our goal, again, is just to define the role and assure that we're all competent, um, too. Beacon is strong about wanting us to make sure we're all comp um, competent nurses, both in the undergrad and graduate um, area. And so I think this next video we, um, Beacon, again, supported to help uh, recruit nurses. And what I see in this video is that we're trying to renew the value of the psychiatric mental health nurse. Psychiatric mental health nursing is a dynamic specialty using a holistic orientation that addresses the mind, body, and spirit of the individual. I needed something that, that was different every day, and mental health definitely is. It, no day is like the day before. As you will hear from these nurses, Mental health nursing not only provides meaningful connections through care, hope, and compassion, it also leads to a very fulfilling career. My initial interest in um, mental health nursing started with my mom. I was, um, when I was a kid, my mom would take me into her work and she's been a psychiatric nurse for 30 years. And, you know, it was a very well-respected position within our family. You know, everybody knew what my mom did and kind of, thought the world of her for her work with those patients. So it, I don't want to say glamorous, but it was definitely a very well respected job that she had in our family. I honestly believe that every patient that I work with, uh, no matter what walk of life, they have hopes and they have dreams, but they need help. Um, sometimes due to situations out of their control, you know, they either feel worthless or they, they feel like they can't go on. The psychiatric mental health nurse works with individuals, families, groups, and communities through assessment of mental health issues. 
And I do all the nursing home consults for our two geriatric psychiatrists that make rounds at the Omaha um, area nursing homes assisted livings. And what I do is I go out in advance of their visit and basically um, collect all the data. I go through the medical records, visit with all the nursing staff, um, get their current medication lists, um, talk with the families, um, gather history about their um, you know, mental, physical conditions, and then I do all the initial interviews with our patients. And you're working both together, trying to figure out what to do and how to manage meds and you know, strategies for them to uh, feel empowered, and then they come in one visit and they, they say that they're doing great and their families have noticed and they feel empowered and they feel that they have a new hope in, um, in their life experiences and, and they're just happy to, to be there where it was such a struggle to even just come to the appointments. The psychiatric mental health nurse develops a nursing diagnosis and plan of care. They then implement the nursing process and evaluate its effectiveness. Um, and then the nursing staff does a group usually, so I'll usually do a group, um, depending on the milieu, I'll either do one about stress management, um, substance misuse, um, anxiety, and I, I like to break it down to um, the scientific reasons of why people experience what they experience. Um, and it, it just kind of hits home to them to justify it and be able to um, use the coping skills that we then discuss. That's something that, that I really try to remember today is you may think you have it all together, that you know, you know you, you've found all the pieces of the puzzle, but you never really have it all. You might think you do, but there's always more. I can think of times when I helped people through suicidal ideations or talked to people about working through their addictions. Um, and I think that those moments where I realized, wow, this is that moment, this is that moment of change for this person. The psychiatric mental health nurse possesses excellent communication skills, relationship skills, and a broad base of knowledge in behavioral sciences. I really wish that I could trademark the expression, it takes hands to wash hands, it takes hearts to heal hearts. And I honestly believe that, you know, to the core of who I am, that only through meaningful engagement with people are, are, there the, are their lives going to change for the better. I think in psychiatric nursing, you as a nurse, the interpersonal relationship, the problem solving that you do with the patient and kind of dealing with the chaos that can get put on your plate in the morning is you acting as medicine for that person. and. In turn, you know, it's very rewarding and that sense of ownership is, re is reinforced by being that medicine for that person. There were opportunities to interact with all of the patients that I would see at Douglas County and their psychiatric units was really about developing that relationship, um, letting them know that we weren't there just for a job, but we were there to really have a relationship with them. Approximately one in four individuals in our society suffer from a mental health diagnosis. Unfortunately, there is a shortage of nurses in the workforce to meet the needs of those affected. Currently, only 4% of registered nurses are in the psychiatric mental health field. Since the Affordable Care Act, more individuals are seeking out services for care further compounding the need for more nurses in the field. The Psychiatric Behavioral Health Service Delivery is moving toward an integrated primary care team-based ambulatory model. I think it's nice to work with people that all love the work too. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why I've stuck with it so long. It's just, you know, it's loving the work and the people that you work with make it fun. It is anticipated the role for the psychiatric mental health nurse will need to expand, which may include mental health screening, telephone triage, monitoring via telehealth, proficiency in low intensity behavioral health interventions, wellness and prevention, and engagement in quality improvement. 
Psychiatric nurses have a significant impact in the lives of patients through the development of relationships through empathetic and non-judgmental interactions. Many psychiatric nurses have found this to be a very rewarding nursing career. Beacon, the Behavioral Health Education Center of Nebraska, is a multidisciplinary collaborative program that recruits, educates, and supports maintenance of students and professional staff in the mental health workplace. The College of Nursing joins efforts with Beacon to recruit nurses to help meet the goals of increasing and retaining psychiatric mental health nurses in Nebraska. Similar to the testimony of the nurses in the video, many nurses in mental health find it to be very rewarding with the opportunity to make a significant difference in a person's life. Being a psychiatric nurse has been incredibly satisfying for me and something that I'm very happy that I did. There's, a, you know, a million times that I know I walked away feeling good and glad that I was there that day because somebody told you that you made the difference. I really love being the one um, being there when they finally get it, when, when the decisions that they've made in their lives, um, the relationships that they've been in, uh, been in uh, the substance abuse, and they realize what the first step they need to take in turning their life around. Um, that's my favorite moment, and that's, that's why I'm going to continue doing this. Like I say, it's really nice to make a lasting impact on somebody's life. And that's one of my favorite parts. So. Right, so this video is on our uh, website for um, undergrad to um, access and under career path. So we hope that they seek it out. And um, if anyone wants to share this video, I could see where we could encourage other uh, universities or um, colleges to be able to have access to um, a tape such as that. So any questions? I think we just have a few minutes left here. No questions? All right. Thank you very much.